Debbie Kluger, host of Keeping It Green. We're at the Ronald Reagan Building and International Trade Center in beautiful Washington, D.C. And we are at the 11th National Conference on Science, Policy, and the Environment. It's sponsored by the National Council for Science and the Environment, and this year's theme is Our Changing Oceans. We're going to go inside and we're going to interview as many people as we can, find out what they think the problems are facing the oceans, what the solutions are, and what you, as the viewing audience can do to help out. Um, you're also going to see some of the lectures that are given by some of the most amazing, talented, and brilliant scientists that our planet has to offer you. And the outcome of the conference will hopefully influence decision makers, policy makers, and the general public in order to find ways to help out the oceans. So I hope you guys enjoy the show, and come on, let's go check it out. This is a three-day event and we are going to try to speak with as many people as we can to try to find out what they feel are the most pressing issues facing the oceans, what they feel the solutions are, and what the general public can do to help. So let's check out what everybody has to say. Hope you guys enjoy the show. Hi, I'm Becky Wynn with the NOAA Marine Debris Program here in Silver Spring. And we're at the National Council of Science and the Environment Conference 2011. This is our poster that we presented. It's um, titled the NOAA Marine Debris Program, Program History and Work to Address Marine Debris. Um, sort of self-explanatory, this is our first time here at this conference, but um, one of the things that a lot of people ask us is what exactly is the definition of marine debris, which until t September 3rd, 2009, we actually hadn't officially, we didn't have an official definition. Um, the, basically, the, def the definition is um, marine debris is any persistent solid material that is manufactured or processed and directly or indirectly, intentionally or unintentionally disposed of or abandoned into the marine environment or the Great Lakes. So that includes the oceans. A little bit of background regarding our program is that the program was created in 2005, but prior to that, NOAA had actually uh, been working on the issue of entanglement research, marine entanglement research, since 1985. But in 2005, a formalized program was created, and on December 22, 2006, President Bush signed it into law. And that was actually the Marine Debris Research Prevention and Reduction Act, which formally established the NOAA Marine Debris Program. So we have, currently, we have offices in um, on the west coast, Alaska, and the Gulf of Mexico. We also have a Pacific Islands region based out of Honolulu, Hawaii. And our headquarters is in Silver Spring, Maryland. And we also recently, in 2010, um, had, we have a new office in the Great Lakes region. So those are where our staff are located, but we do issues across the country, and um, that's why we're a national program. So some of the things that we do is the no marine debris serves as the centralized marine debris capability within NOAA in order to coordinate, strengthen, and increase visibility of marine debris issues and efforts within the agency, its partners, and the public. So in a nutshell, we basically coordinate with universities, we coordinate on national, international, and regional levels on the issues of marine debris. Um, we work with uh, everything from coordination meetings to research planning and coordination and design to outreach and education events to increase um, knowledge of the public when it comes to the impacts of marine debris. And we have two examples of some really great collaboration and partnerships that we have done that are just highlighted on this poster. You can of course get any additional material on our program at www.marinedebris.noaa.gov we also have a blog, Marine Debris Blog, 
backslash wordpress.com where you can keep up to date on all the latest things that we're doing. Two of the cool projects that we're doing right now is, one is called the Fishing for Energy Project, and that's a partnership between NOAA, Covanta Energy, Schnitzer Steel, and National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, as well as local community partners such as fishermen, um, who basically have started collecting and properly disposing of derelict fishing gear. And this program spans 10 different states around the country, and um, then where after that all of the nets can be incinerated and produce renewable energy source. So, and anything that cannot be incinerated, actually the metal parts can be recycled. So it's a really great program that involves lots of different constituents. And then um, one of the education and outreach partnership examples that we have is we have a partnership with the University of Georgia right now, which is focused on developing collaboration among three states, North Carolina, South Carolina, and Georgia, when it comes to um, bringing together resources and decision makers when it comes to dealing with the impacts of marine debris in that, in that environment. And they are developing cool ways of reaching out to the public as well as to the people within these, in this geographic area on this issue by, they've developed an iPhone app as well as um, they Twitter and they also use social media channels to provide this information so that people can learn from what they're currently doing but also share information and resources. So, um, and then the, one of the biggest international efforts that we're working on right now is NOAA is a co-sponsor or co-organizing the 5th International Marine Debris Conference, which will be taking place in Honolulu, Hawaii, March 20th through the 25th this coming year. And it's really an opportunity to bring together an international marine debris community of researchers, natural resource managers, policy makers, um, industry representatives, as well as non-governmental community members, such as nonprofits and educational um, folks to talk about the status of marine debris work internationally and sort of put together a working model of how to move forward on this issue beyond the meeting. So we're very excited about that and we will be um, very active in terms of our blog and our Twitter in the next coming months, so stay tuned. And if you have any questions, you can always reach us at marinedebris.noaa.gov or marinedebris at info.gov. Um, so, there you go. Can I ask you what the average citizen to, can do to help stop the problem of marine debris? Well, that's actually a really great question. We have opportunities around the country, partners such as the Ocean Conservancy have for 25 years been sponsoring a international effort called the International Coastal Cleanup. You can contact local chapters of the Ocean Conservancy. Their headquarters is here in DC, but they have um, partnership opportunities where you can reach out and be a part of a cleanup. Earth Day, there are always a lot of opportunities to participate in cleanup. I think the biggest thing we like to encourage everyday citizens to do is the old adage of reduce, reuse, and recycle. Whenever possible, try and reduce your use of things that are not degradable or um, renewable and reuse what you can and recycle what you can so that it can be turned into products that we can use down the line. So that is sort of, in a nutshell, our program. And if you have any questions, you can contact us at marinedebris.noaa.com. Thank you. No problem. My name is John Bruno. I'm an assistant professor at UNC Chapel Hill in the Department of Biology. Um, I think one thing the public really ought to understand is just the profound changes that are coming our way in my lifetime, in our lifetimes, driven by anthropogenic climate change. So the oceans are already warming. About 90% of the additional heat coming from greenhouse gases are warming the oceans rather than the land and the atmosphere. So that's really where all the action is. And we're just going to see just changes beyond description over the next couple of decades. And it goes much further than animals dying. So a lot of marine ecologists, like my colleagues and I, study how warming kills animals. It stresses them out physiologically, and we lose habitat farming species like corals and kelp. 
but the changes are much more fundamental than that. So we're seeing changes in how quickly um, animals develop, how quickly the, the larvae develop, the babies of organisms, um, how far they disperse. Um, how food webs operate. So warming means, a, a warmer world means a faster world. So animal metabolism is very closely linked with temperature. So the warmer it gets, the faster everything happens. And that has really profound implications for food webs, how they operate, which has in turn implications for fisheries and um, human livelihoods near the coast. So just, it's just hard to describe how big the changes are going to be um, over the next couple of decades. And I think the best take home example I know of is the Antarctic. So the Antarctic benthic communities are a really special, um, unique community on Earth. So it's a system that's been essentially predator-free for about 40 million years, and it's because it's so cold. So since it's so cold, there's very few bone-crushing predators. So things like sharks and rays and big crabs that eat animals on the seafloor um, don't really exist there. And as a result, we've got a lot of very undefended, kind of big, juicy, goofy animals that really they haven't evolved with the presence of a bone crushing predator and in just a couple of decades we're going to see that system invaded by predators like sharks and skates and king crabs simply because of the warming and it's just going to completely devastate the community and we're expecting that we're going to lose that really unique community on earth that's been there for really hundreds of millions of years um, at least 40 million years since there's been any predators down there so that's just the kind of profound change marine ecologists are studying and predicting and really worried about seeing and Again, this isn't something that's going to happen way into the future. It's going to happen in our lifetimes. In fact, we're already seeing it happen. So what do you think the average person can do to help stop these changes or slow them down? Or? Well, there's a huge amount the average person can do in terms of um, changes in, in just their personal behavior. You can, everybody can monitor their carbon footprint because this all really comes down to greenhouse gas emissions, so how much fossil fuels we're each burning cumulatively that determines how much and how fast the Earth warms. Um, and you can go online and just Google um, carbon footprint and type in um, their, your fossil fuel consumption from your airplane flights and your automobile and your power usage in your house and really get a sense. And it's pretty darn easy to cut it in half just with a few changes, you know, replacing your light bulbs with energy efficient light bulbs. I, I just got a Prius um, that I bought on eBay and it gets 48 miles to the gallon. So, you know, I've tripled the miles per gallon of the car I drive and it's just as big and just as safe as the other car. So it's not always this big trade-off you know, to have a, a lower impact. And I think as scientists, our biggest challenge is public education. I mean, the public knows so little about these changes. Most Americans don't even believe climate change is happening when it's just, it's just an irrefutable fact that it's going on all around us. And so it's, it's obviously part of the responsibility of science, scientists and the media to educate the public, but the public has a big responsibility to learn about what's happening, I think, to educate each other, you know? So the people that know about it need to tell their parents and their kids and their aunts and uncles about it. And I think that's probably the, the biggest thing individuals can do is really just educate themselves and each other. Thank you. You're very welcome. Hi, my name is Renata Lana and I work for NOAA and I work on a campaign called the Eat Lionfish Campaign. And what we're trying to do is encourage people to eat an invasive species, which actually tastes great. Uh, it's a little bit between a grouper and a snapper. And it's, but it's doing some real damage to our reefs in the southeast. Uh, from all throughout the Caribbean, it's invaded from Florida all the way up to North Carolina. You see a few of them in New York, but they tend not to survive over the winter because they die out from the cold. Uh, but I think that something that people can do everywhere is think about an invasive or diet, which means there's invasive species everywhere and some of those you can actually eat. Uh, we certainly, you can you know, go in your backyard and certainly eat dandelions, that's not an invasive species, but you can imagine there's all kinds of plants that might be really tasty and might be something you can pull up and as part of getting rid of them out of your, your yard, uh, help the environment at the same time. I'm not uh, familiar with what you would have in New York, but if you do a little research, I bet you can find out. There's an article on chow.com that has done a study on invasive diets, and there was a recent article in New York Times, and uh, do a little research and find that. Thanks, Deborah. I'm Bob Carell. I work with the Global Environment and Technology Foundation, as well as with a whole group of scientists 
under a rubric which we call <coughs> Global Science Associates. And uh, this is a really important Congress meeting because the ocean, you know, is about 70% of the, the world, but it really controls how climate change and many other processes on the planet um, occur. So climate change as we know it would not would be occurring a lot faster if it weren't for the thermodynamic slowdown that the ocean provides. On the other hand, it extends things for many hundreds of years. So I think some of the critical issues, the near-term critical issue we've just had a session on, is what we call ocean acidification. And it's a very simple idea. If you have a lot of carbon dioxide sitting on top of the ocean, the ocean's going to absorb that carbon dioxide, just like there's carbon dioxide in your Coke bottle. And what happens is when that well, absorbs into the ocean, to you? the ocean becomes more acid. And so we have changed the ocean across the globe by about 30%. We have more acidic base to the ocean. And that affects the top of the a food chain all the way up through mammals like uh, seals and whales and so on. The whole food chain is going to be affected. And that's one only because the CO2 is there. It had nothing to do with temperature, all this other stuff we hear about climate change. This is just the mere existence of carbon dioxide. So that's a biggie. The second, I think, is, is a changing sea level. Uh, it's now pretty clear that the projections are that we will see a meter or more by the end of this century. So let's say you have four feet by 2100. That's a foot every generation. So if your children are in your house the next time they're in the house on the coast, there'll be a foot more of sea level. And that's gonna change things in the US, the whole region around New Orleans and the southern part of Florida are dramatically affected by that. But internationally, we got some biggies. You got Bangladesh will lose upwards of 30 to 40 percent of its land mass by the end, and that's where all the people live. And where are those people going to go? They're going to be what we call environmental refugees. And uh, it's what uh, turned around Margaret Thatcher and others recognizing that these things have huge political implications when we transform what's happening in the coastal margin. I think those are the two big ones. There are some others that are coming along, the change in the, in the character of the ocean to support for the food chain. Most of the people around the world do, do eat extensively out of the ocean. We less than others, but uh, the transformation is there and we'll see how that plays out. That's probably got a longer time scale. I live on the Chesapeake, and we've already had about a foot and a half of sea level rise, which is huge. We've lost large pieces of land. One of the great wildlife preserves is 30% uh, gone. Probably by 2040, it'll be totally gone. One of the largest flyways going back and forth. So a lot of these things have real near-term, in-your-own-backyard implications, even though the climate issue tends to be thought of as a global one. But it's going to affect us in our own backyard and going to affect land values, where people live. And things. So it's a delight never to talk to you, and we wish your, your friends in uh, Long Island to uh, hear more about the ocean, because sea level rise is going to affect some people on Long Island, I can tell you, because I know a number of them. Hi, I'm Tony Michaels. I have a environmental technology company, Proteus Environmental Technologies, where we have a novel business model for how to get new technologies out to the world, out of universities and into the markets. And, um, and I think there are two key issues that, that, that people should really think about when it comes to the ocean. One is the, the whole carbon problem, but not from a climate perspective, from the perspective of the acidification of the ocean. And the second is how we feed ourselves from the sea, uh, all the fisheries and aquaculture issues. And um, uh, when it comes to acidification, these greenhouse gases we put in the atmosphere, we talk about this climate effect, which is real and something that has to be, be managed. But at the same time, that CO2 is dissolving in the ocean and it's making it more acidic. And that's wrecking havoc in a very slow way with the ecology of the sea, coral reefs, with the larvae of many of the fish and animals that live in the ocean. And we really have to come to grips with this chemical change in the sea that's being precipitated by these same gases that we argue about from a global warming perspective. And this is going on and it's going to take a hundred years, so it's a slow problem, but it doesn't 
go backwards. It's a very, very difficult thing to reverse without changing how we uh, uh, manage these greenhouse gases and how many fossil fuels we burn. So I think one of the key issues for how you can manage this issue is it's all about the things we do every day and how much greenhouse gas CO2 gets emitted. It's all going to end up in the ocean someday. So when you think about what you do in your house, the simplest thing you can do is use less energy. Change your light bulbs to LEDs. You get a short payback that makes you money in the long term uh, for that one-time cost, and all of a sudden the cost of the, of, of the greenhouse gas CO2 production from turning your light bulbs on goes down 70-80%. You can drive less, you can drive more carefully, you can do things to buy more energy efficient appliances. Every time you make a decision, think, is this something that resulted in a certain amount of CO2 being put in the atmosphere? And is there a way to have it be less CO2 if I would buy something different, something that, that in essence reflected that personal value I have for the ocean more closely than the product I'm going to buy? So a lot of it's just thinking, reducing what we use. Ultimately, there's going to be, have to be changes in how we make energy. But the short-term thing you can do right now is use less. And you save money. And saving money is a good thing. And so you can use that money you save to buy more fish. And we use fish as one of the primary ways our lives are touched by the sea. We eat seafood, we eat fish from fresh waters. It's a big part of our diet. It's a very, very healthy part of our diet. You will be healthier, you will live longer, your kids will be smarter if you eat more seafood. But at the same time I say that, we're harvesting the oceans to death. We're taking out more fish in many fisheries than the oceans can handle. It's gotten better in the last few years. And there are now a number of fisheries that are more sustainably managed or some that are very sustainably managed, but there are still many that are overfished. And so when you think about your seafood purchases, you can get the little card from these different aquaria that lets you say, okay, I want to buy this type of seafood because this type of seafood is more sustainably caught. At the same time, that seafood may be sustainably caught off the coast of New Zealand. And that seafood caught off the coast of New Zealand comes to the United States on an airplane or on a boat. And when it does that, it emits greenhouse gases. And so you also still want to think, is there a way to get a lower carbon version of that seafood that also is a lower impact on the ocean? How do you do that? You buy local. You buy things that are caught locally. You have to buy things that are caught locally and sustainably fished. For every place you live, you have to understand what those are. But once you know it, it doesn't change very quickly. And you can just say, I'm buying this lobster, I'm buying this kind of fish, because these are the things that are sustainably caught, they're produced locally, it doesn't take much CO2 to get here. But really, in the long term, we aren't hunter-gatherers anymore. It is time, and this is starting to happen worldwide, that we farm the food that we get from, from, from fish and from oysters and shellfish and shrimp, that, that the farmed variety becomes a larger and larger part of our diet. Uh, the hunter-gathering mode we left a long time ago on land, it's time to think more carefully about getting this food to our tables in a clean, sustainable way. And this now, about half of all seafood that you eat is farmed. We import almost all of that seafood right now. Um, some of it's sustainably produced, some of it's not. Again, these little cards can give you some clues. But the real question is you want to drive that change. When you go to a restaurant, ask them, where did you get this from? Is it sustainably caught? How do you know that it's sustainably caught? Again, it doesn't change very quickly. So once you know the answer, once you know the retailer or the distributor that provides sustainable seafood, reward that restaurant by saying, oh, I'm going to have the seafood tonight because I know you bought it from the right place. Oh, uh, well, I'm not going to eat that because I can't know if it's been sustainably produced. We need to have more food produced by aquaculture. It's the most efficient way to produce high quality, healthy animal protein uh, for the human diet. Uh, uh, and we need more of it in our diet, but we have to do it well. We have to do it in a way which is clean, minimizes the pollution impacts, doesn't have all kinds of crazy chemicals in it, uh, doesn't destroy the oceans in the process of getting the, the things it takes to grow those fish. Uh, but those are all things that are now known. We know how to do it. It's up to the market to say, I want the better version. I want the better version of even the things that people consider bad. Farm salmon can be done bad, it can be done well. You have to say, I want to farm salmon, I want it done well. Tell me that this product is the one that was made correctly, that this is the one that didn't hurt the planet when it was made, and this is the one that was made just down the street rather than halfway around the planet. If we do those things, demand those things of the market, those demands flow up to the people that ultimately produce these things, those then 
result in the kinds of changes that I think we want to see in the oceans. My name is Sandra Wise. I'm from the University of Southern Maine in Portland, Maine. Um, I think the main problem with the oceans today is the amount of pollution, the amount of polluting that we do to the ocean. Um, for a long time, people have treated the oceans as if they can handle everything that they throw at it, and that's not true. We're finding that, that it's not true at all. Um, we work on looking at contaminants in, uh, specifically in uh, marine mammals. So we've looked at contaminant levels in sperm whales um, and found that even, if, even in some very remote places, there's um, high levels of contaminants in these animals. Um, so what we put in the oceans right near us is traveling everywhere. Um, so it's a major problem, and I think a lot of people aren't aware that it is as big of a problem as it is. Um, I think public outreach and education is a big part of it. Is there, the general public just doesn't know. They don't think it's a. They can't conceive that an ocean that big would ever, you know, suffer from a little bit of trash or a little bit of sewage, or that th that it can absorb it all. <clears throat> um, so I think public outreach and education is a big part of of how to solve it, and just teaching people to be aware of the things that they throw out, the things that they pour down the drain that ends up in the ocean. And what ends up in the ocean eventually will end up back on your plate in your seafood. So it's very important for people to know these kinds of things.